All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our uh, Aquarium's Online Academy. My name is Talia. I am from our education department here at the Aquarium, uh, and I'm really excited to share a little bit of my morning with you. Um, so today, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit um, about uh, food webs today. So we'll learn a little bit more about what is that and uh, what some of the components of those are, and maybe um, look at some examples uh, of a food web as well. So that's kind of our game plan for this morning. Um, now, if you are curious about anything uh, during our session today, if I say something and you want to know a little bit more about something, if you're curious about anything, um, if you have some ocean questions, uh, please let me know. And you can do that um, through a couple different ways, depending, ooh, that was an interesting flash of light there on our webcam, um, depending on when uh, you're watching this program. So if you're watching this program live, uh, on, let's see, what is it, Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're welcome to text in those questions, uh, and that number is down below now on your screen. It is right there, 562-286-1838, um, or if you're watching this later, um, you're welcome to email us instead, and the email address is right there, live at lbaop.org. So those are two ways to interact with us, depending. Uh, on when you are watching our program. So again, if you're watching this live right now, uh, 9 o'clock Wednesday morning, uh, you are welcome to text in those questions uh, as you have them. Uh, and I have my friend uh, Courtney, uh, they are going to be uh, keeping an eye on that chat line and relaying questions to me. So let's get started, my friends. Um, and let's take a moment actually to wake up our science brain uh, and look at some observations about what's going on in behind me because I think one of the examples I'm going to be trying to be focusing on today with a food web is uh, something that's in the kelp forest and I notice my friends that there's kind of a lot going on in this in this home here in this habitat so there's lots of different animals uh, there's some things that are not animals in there as well there's some rocks uh, there's also some kelp it's probably a good thing that there's kelp in a kelp forest uh, so you have some kind of plant life hanging out there as well. You have all sorts of fish of different shapes and sizes. And you even have really, really small things in there as well, um, like urchins or So yeah, the kelp forest is a really interesting habitat. And there's kind of a lot, there's a lot of layers and there's kind of a lot going on. So let's take a moment, friends. Um, to figure out some basics about what is a food web or what is a food chain. So I'm going to go over to my document camera over here and let's try to kind of piece out a little bit what a food web or a food chain is. All right, so I'm going to hop over to my document camera here. me hello um and let's try to figure out a little bit about what a food web or food chain is so um most times when we think about a food chain it's something that's really linear linear so you have um for example you might have some let's let's do a land example we have some some grass and then there's a, I don't know if I can draw a cow, let's find out. <laughs> Ooh, there's a funky cow, that's okay. There's a, I swear that's a cow. <laughs> I didn't plan this out very well. There's a cow that eats the grass and then maybe later, there's a person that has a hamburger for dinner. And that's kind of how we think of um, a food chain. So it's like A gets eaten by B gets eaten by C. But sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? So we have um, different things 
being eaten by a variety of different things. So we just don't eat hamburgers all the time. Maybe, uh, maybe we also um, want to eat um, a nice salad. Um, cows. I think cows might eat different things as well. But it starts getting kind of really complicated. Grass. Got the sun. Ooh, give it some energy. So it starts getting really complicated the more things we start adding and the more different things that one different animal can eat. Uh, that's how we get to things like a food web. So we've gone from a very simple um, grass cow human to uh, something that's a little bit more complicated. And that's not just true on land, but it's also true in um, the ocean as well. Um, so let's take a look at some things in the ocean and specifically some things uh, in the kelp forest. So let's see, I'm going to go draw, let's draw some water. All right, so we have in our kelp forest, in our kind of ocean food web or food chain, we have some kelp. And the kelp uh, is what we call a producer. So that means that it can make its own food. It doesn't have to go uh, hunt or look for its food or consume its food. It can produce food or energy um, from itself. So it's getting its energy from the sun. Got the sun in but I'm going to go move that down so you can see it a little bit better. That's better. Okay, so. The sun is giving energy to the kelp. And the kelp is, again, producing its own food. And it does that uh, through photosynthesis. So it's taking its energy from the sun um, and it is producing essentially sugar uh, from that and that is how it's getting its energy and kind of doing its thing. It's also taking in I think the carbon dioxide and then giving us some oxygen uh, as well. So it's another important thing to keep the oceans nice. Ooh, I just flipped my camera around. That's okay. Hold on. There we go. I knew I pressed a button. I wasn't expecting to press that button. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, it's also more complicated when you turn your food web upside down. Anyways, um, so kelp produces its own uh, food through photosynthesis. So it is considered a producer. Now within the kelp forest as well, you're also going to get some consumers uh, as well. So consumers are things that are going to have to eat to consume their food. They can't make food within their own body, so they have to go out and get it. And you kind of have different, we call different um, animals or organisms, um, different things depending on sort of what they are preferring uh, to eat. So you have some animals that like to eat plants. And one of these actually eats um, the kelp. So let me see if I can draw some ground down here. Me shade it in so you know it is ground and not water. Um, Courtney, do you mind taking away the question? Um, I just realized I'm going to draw an urchin right underneath that. Um, perfect. So one of the things that eats uh, eats not only just eats plant life. Uh, but also eats kelp itself um, is a sea urchin. So I'm going to draw a picture. You can't see that. Perfect. All right. I'm going to draw an urchin here. And an urchin is going to eat the kelp. And it's considered um, a consumer. It's also considered an herbivore and an herbivore is something 
that likes to eat plants. So an urchin is going to eat the kelp. Um, and there's also something in the ocean that likes to eat urchins. Um, and it is also considered a consumer, but uh, since it is eating more so meat, uh, it is going to be considered um, a carnivore. And that is an otter. Let's see if I can Google what an otter likes to eat. So an otter is going to eat the urchin. And um, they actually play a really important role uh, in the kelp forest uh, through that because they actually help keep the urchin population um, in check um, so that there's not too many urchins uh, and that makes the kelp forest uh, nice and healthy. Um, let's take a moment, my friends, to take a look at kind of what an urchin and an otter look like uh, in real life since I have a lot of a lot of doodles uh, on my screen here. You didn't come for a draw with me class. Um, but yeah, this is what an urchin looks like in real life if you've never seen one before. This is what it looks like. Um, and it will actually uh, eat kelp. This one's kind of hanging out on the blade of a kelp. It's kind of what it looks like, the leaf-like structure of kelp. Um, there's its little kind of air bladder there. That's how kelp floats all the way up to the surface. They also love uh, eating the whole fast of kelp, which is kind of the bottom. It kind of looks like a clump of spaghetti. That's kind of the anchor point of kelp that attaches to uh, some sort of uh, ground or rock or substrate to hold it uh, in there. So urchins will actually take um, their spines and kind of use that to sort of pinch on uh, to kelp. They also have little, you can kind of see it in this picture, uh, they also have little tube feet as well. So they have little sticky little feet, kind of looks like little threads there. Um, and they'll use that to help sort of hold on to kelp, uh, bring it around to the bottom and that's where their mouth is. Now they don't really have like chompers uh, or teeth, like we have teeth. Ooh, I've never seen this picture before. That's awesome. Okay, so this is, I think the bottom of an urchin is what we're looking at. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, there is, ooh, I'm actually recognizing where this picture was taken. Uh, I am distracted. Anyways, bottom of the urchin, right there. Um, there's all its spines, but you can kind of see these long threads sticking out beyond the spines, and those are all their sticky tube feet. So they're going to use that to not only, um, in this case, stick to the window, uh, but also to grab on to kelp. Uh, and um, bring it around to the middle where, oh, I think you can actually see it right there. Bah! This is a great picture. Um, its mouth. Its mouth has kind of like four little teeth, um, and they'll use that to kind of grind it up and munch on kelp. Um, so they'll use those spines to bring it around and eat all the yummy kelp. And then otters um, will eat a lot of different things. Uh, but so remember, thinking about that food web, uh, it gets kind of complicated the more and more uh, things that different animals can eat. Um, but they specifically uh, really, really like, um, or at least some of them do, really like urchins so much so that they help keep that population um, in check. You can actually tell which otters like urchins because their teeth start turning purple. It even sometimes that pigment from the spines of the urchins sometimes even leaches into their bones. Uh, as well. So if you ever uh, had a, like a, a popsicle or a lollipop uh, and your lips have turned blue and your tongue's turned blue uh, and you've gone home and your mom's like, mm, I know what you had for a snack today. Um, that's kind of what happens a little bit more so on a permanent level uh, with the otters that really, really like uh, or prefer um, urchins. Uh, and because things like food chains and food webs, they get kind of complicated. Um, that means that if you start removing parts of that chain, um, it can really kind of upset the balance 
uh, of habitat. And then otters, by the way, uh, this one's I think munching on some shrimp right now, uh, but they have nice teeth. They have molars as well to help them crunch open things uh, that are, are hard like an urchin. They also will use tools as well. So actually go use and grab, say, a rock to break open something in a hard shell uh, like an urchin as well. They'll float on their back and uh, kind of use their tummy as their dining room table. But yeah, that's kind of a question that we we we've, we kind of found out the hard way, unfortunately. Uh, but we we found out kind of what happens. What happens when you don't have a lot of otters anymore? Otters do have a nice uh, fur uh, coat on them, which helps keep them nice and toasty. One that's one of their adaptations to help them out in the ocean. They don't have a thick layer of blubber like other marine mammals do, like seals and sea lions and whales. So they have their nice fur coat to help them keep warm. Um, and when they were being historically hunted for their fur, uh, we started to realize, well, whoa, we don't have really nice kelp floors anymore because um, kind of going back to, I'm going to go back to my drawing here, um, going back to our, our uh, food web here, um, if the otters, so we had, what am I trying to do, kelp? urchin to otter. If you start taking away the otters, then all of a sudden the urchin's population is going to go up, right? Because you don't have things that are eating the urchins anymore, so there's going to be more and more and more and more urchins. Um, if you have things, um, a, an area where all of a sudden you have lots more urchins, they're going to be like, ooh, I have lots of lovely kelp to eat. So the kelp is going to go down. Um, and that not only affects, um, say, where the otters live, but remember, lot, we saw before in that webcam um, that the kelp forest is home to a lot of different animals, right? It's not just, it's not just the otters, right? There's some fish that call it their home. There's some sharks that hang out. I'm going to work on my shark. <laughs> That's okay. There's some sharks that call it their home. Through There's lots of different animals that live in the kelp forest. So all of a sudden, if there's no more kelp, um, then there's a lot of different animals um, that don't have um, a home anymore. So that's why that balance. Ooh, here's what a kelp forest looks like in the ocean. Kind of swaying back and forth. And there's the sun uh, coming, peeking out. Uh, from the top there. So yeah, it's really important that those kind of food webs that kind of balance uh, gets maintained within these habitats so that kind of everything has a place, but there's not too much or too little uh, of one thing uh, or the other. And that kind of kelp to urchin to otter example is a really good um, example of uh, what happens when that balance kind of gets out of whack. Um, but thankfully, um, we kind of realized a little bit uh, of our mistakes, right? So we did a couple of things to help out the otters. Uh, there was a fur treaty a long time ago in 1911. Uh, there was uh, other different legislation and, and, and um, regulations in place to help them. We had a Marine Mountain Protection Act helping them out as well. And that, in turn, has helped the otter population go back up again. And that means we're getting more balance in places like the kelp forest. You don't just have like sand and urchins anymore because uh, things are getting back into balance, you're starting to have some healthier kelp forests uh, off of our coast, which means that all the other animals that call the kelp forest their home um, have a place to hang out as well. So yeah, really important to help keep that balance. And again, if you have any questions, my friends, if you're wondering about anything during our program today, you're again welcome to text in those questions. Uh, we'll get that number back on the screen since I'm not doodling at the moment anymore. Let's see if I can remember it. It is 562-286-ZIP-1838. Again, you're welcome to text and questions uh, if you have any questions during our program. Um, so yeah, kelp floors, super important, really great example uh, of a food web, food chain kind of situation. And what happens when those things uh, kind of get out of balance, get out of whack? Now, uh, we talked a little bit about sort of different animals are called different things depending on what they eat, right? Um, we have, we talked about the herbivores. They like to eat plants. 
we talked about the carnivores. They like to eat meat. Uh, but there's a couple other kind of ways we can call different groups of animals depending on what they eat. Because sometimes there's animals that eat both. They eat meat and plant life or vegetables. They kind of want some salad with their steak dinner. Uh, and we call those animals omnivores. Uh, sometimes I like to think of it as om nom nom uh, They just like to eat everything. Uh, so humans could be an example uh, of an omnivore. Um, and then we have examples out in um, the ocean world as well. Uh, we have, in the kelp forest, we have some uh, little fish called half moons. I don't know if we have a, a picture of that, uh, Courtney. We also have some tropical examples as, as well. Um, if we can't find a half moon, um, we also have bonnet head sharks. We have a shark that's an omnivore uh, that we just recently discovered, uh, I want to say a couple of years ago uh, as well. So I'm going to give Courtney a moment to find some media for me. I'm sending them on a little bit of a goose chase, uh, but that's okay. Uh, but yeah, woo, we did it. Yay. Okay, so this is a bonnet head shark. Um, a lot of people look at this and say, ooh, it's a baby hammerhead. It's so cute. And they're close. Um, it is in the same family as a hammerhead, um, but it's the smallest member of that family. So you might notice a couple things. You might notice that their head looks, uh, it's still a long head, but the shape's a little bit different. It's not as, um, as just kind of straight out, like we think of the big hammerheads. This is a small shark. This only gets, I want to say about like three feet, maybe a little bit more than three feet. So about like the length of my arm. Um, they're a pretty small shark. Um, their head is also um, a little bit more rounded in the front. So I think that's where it gets its name. It kind of looks like it's wearing a bonnet. It looks like it's wearing an old-fashioned hat. Uh, so head's a little bit different. But yeah, we recently discovered that this friend is an omnivore. So not only is it eating meat like we expect a lot of sharks to be eating meat, uh, but uh, we found out that they also not only take in seagrass, uh, but they're getting nutrients from that. That's kind of the key, right? You're not just like putting something into, um, into your body and processing it, but you're actually extracting the nutrients from it uh, as well. So yeah, we recently discovered that the bonnet hat shark, this is a tropical shark. I've kind of gone to a warmer place today for the kind of end of our session here. Um, they uh, eat not only meat, but plant life as well. So they are considered an example uh, of an omnivore, which is not only really cool, but really cool for sharks. I know a lot of things, times when we think about sharks, we are, oh, they're carnivores, they eat meat. Um, but yeah, science is tricky. There's always exceptions. So yeah, really cool discovery that we made a couple of years ago with uh, our bonnet head sharks. All right, so we have herbivores, we have carnivores, we have omnivores, we have omnivores. Um, and then we also have um, animals that kind of eat the leftovers um, and or the dead or decaying material. And that would be things that we call decomposers. And I think we, again, kind of associate a lot of that with things on land, right? Maybe we think of uh, in a forest, we have snails and worms and things that lay all the creepy crawlies in the ground that are going to eat all the leftovers and kind of help bring that cycle of life kind of back to the beginning again. Um, we also have things like that in the ocean uh, as well. So we do have like worms and snails and things that like to eat leftovers. Um, and we also have um, some animals as well, uh, like a sea cucumber uh, that can eat uh, the leftovers uh, as well. Courtney's gonna go hunt for some media for me. I should have prepped them a little bit more before I decided to go on a chase for media, but that's okay. We work on our feet here at the aquarium. So a seek, woo, you're finding all sorts of fun pictures that I've never seen before. I'm learning stuff too today. I'm learning about all the new media we have on our computer. Hooray. This is, this looks like, I can't tell if this is tropical. This looks, this looks, this looks like a Dalmatian. <laughs> It's making me really happy right now. <laughs>
<laughs> um, so, anywho's, this is a sea cucumber. This is actually one of my favorite animals because a lot of times the ones we have are in California. They look kind of spiky. Um, and a lot of friends are, are like, oh, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to interact with that because it looks spiky. It looks like it's going to be hard. It's actually really soft and squishy. Um, so yeah, I like sea cucumbers. This looks like a tropical type of sea cucumber with really pretty black and white pattern on their body. I'm really digging that. Um, and they like to eat leftovers. So they will not only eat leftover bits of food and things that other animals might leave behind, but they're also going to be like kind of shrug into the sediment and the sand and kind of getting left over that that way uh, as well. So yeah, a sea cucumber would be an example uh, of an animal that is a decomposer. So it's eating kind of all the dead, decaying leftover stuff and again, helping keep all that stuff in balance in our habitat of uh, not only the kelp forest, uh, but it looks like we got some tropical friends as well, but also out in the coral reefs where the bonnet head hangs out as well. So yeah, food webs, super duper important um, in terms of kind of learning a little bit more about different habitats, how different animals and plants and because remember, it's not just it's not just animals, it's animals, plants, that's all those layers, producers, consumers, etc how all of that interacts together, uh, it's really important to learn more about that, right? If we kind of understand how things connect, how things interact with each other, uh, we can kind of, I feel like, make better decisions about the ocean, right? If we don't kind of remove a piece of the puzzle and go like, oh no, that didn't work out so well. Let me put that piece of the puzzle back in. But learning how everything kind of interplays, what keeps what in balance, that's really important with uh, not just learning more about those individuals, uh, but also learning more about that kind of community uh, that they're serving, that habitat that they live in, and how um, those all sort of interplay, interact with each other. And if we can learn a little bit more about sort of what interacts with us, what, um, I feel like we can make better decisions um, about how to better serve those animals, uh, protect those communities, protect those areas to make sure that our ocean um, kind of stays nice and healthy and, and balance. And again, we kind of learned that with our uh, otter example as well. Otters went out of the picture uh, historically and we realized, ooh, that affected a, not just, we don't have adorable otters anymore, but that affected a whole bunch of other things in terms of the uh, kelp forest that they called their home. So yeah, really, really important um, to make sure that our kelp forest uh, stayed nice and healthy was learning more about our otters, learning more how about how that interacted with the urchins, uh, among other things, and helping to better protect uh, our kill force and other things by protecting otters. So yeah, super duper important. Um, we have a couple more moments together, friends, before I say uh, goodbye. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to text them in. Uh, again, you can use that text line down below 562-286-1838. Uh, and again, if you have any questions later, if you're just kind of absorbing all this information and later on in the day, you're like, oh man, I really wish I asked Miss Talia this question. Um, you are welcome to uh, email those questions instead. Again, that email address is down below live at lbaop.org. Uh, but yeah, um, I hope we had fun learning a little bit more about our kelp forest, um, which I use as an example for food webs, where things get complicated, lots of different things eat lots of different things, but you still have those layers. You have those producers, consumers, omnivores, carnivores, herbivores, decomposers, uh, or something a little bit more simplified, like a food chain where you have A, B, C kind of down in a line. So I hope we had fun exploring a little bit more about our kelp forest and our food webs in our ocean habitat. Uh, learning a little bit more about cute, adorable, fuzzy otters uh, and urchins and our kelp horse. Kelp is pretty cool uh, as well. It also grows very quickly. It grows about two feet in a day in the right conditions. So uh, it not only grows all the way from the bottom all the way up to the top where it's nice and sunny, um, but it keeps growing horizontally. It just kind of flops on the bottom, Boop, keeps growing uh, this way as well. So yeah, kelp itself is a really amazing part of 
that food web as well. So again, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you had fun learning more about our food webs this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. If there are any teachers watching, if you wouldn't mind texting in the number of students that are watching with you, uh, that way we get a little bit more of an accurate idea of our viewership and how to help better serve our communities. We'd appreciate that. Again, you can text those student numbers in to the number below on your screen, 562-286-1838. But again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we have another program coming up at 10 o'clock. It's going to be uh, our uh, bilingual program. So you're welcome to stick around for that. I don't know what the theme is for this program, but I'm sure it's going to be amazing. So uh, please feel free to tune in again at 10 o'clock. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your morning. Bye, everybody.